I was actually born preterm, and the doctors told my mother that she would kill me if she tried to breastfeed. She happened to have a nurse who stood by her side and basically fought for her right to breastfeed. Balloons, bazookas, boob, boobies, bosoms, boulders, cans, hooters, knockers, melons, honkers, jugs, rack, tatas, tits, torpedoes, guns, bust, doorknobs, coconuts, and our favorite one, the girls. Welcome to the All About Breastfeeding Show, where your host, Lori, highlights mothers just like yourself and goes beyond the surface questions and digs deep so they share not only their joys and happiness in their daily breastfeeding life, but also their pain and struggles and how they worked through them. Episode number 167. Welcome to All About Breastfeeding, the place where the girls hang out. I am your host, Lori Jill Eisenstadt, IBCLC, and I help moms with breastfeeding. We are all in for a real treat today. My guest is a fellow IBCLC who has been working with breastfeeding families for over 20 years. And I really enjoyed hearing her tell us about her first breastfeeding experience and what impact this had on her role as an IBCLC. Laurel also has a love of learning and she shares with us some fascinating information she's learned from her research. Some highlights just to whet your appetite. We get into a fascinating discussion of how our thoughts during pregnancy can impact our babies in utero. Not only our thoughts, but Laurel has me riveted with the latest research on the placenta and the role it plays during pregnancy. Some of this is news I've not heard before, and to know that there is a placenta project research studies going on, which will learn even more about the amazing placenta, Well, this really excites me. And we get into a really good discussion about the idea of educating moms about information that others think might make them feel guilty. Laurel gives her response to feedback on others' opinions about possibly holding back information just because it might make them feel guilty about their choices. You will also be interested to hear her answer to my question about what does the research show about breastfeeding babies beyond one year of age. At the end of the show, I will share her contact information in case you have any specific questions for her. Okay, let's get started with her introduction first, and then on with the show. Laurel Wilson, IBCLC, is an author, international speaker, and pregnancy and lactation expert. She served as the Executive Director of Lactation Programs for CAPPA, which stands for the Childbirth and Postpartum Professional Association for 16 years, and now is on the Senior Advisor Board. She's also on the Board of Directors for the United States Breastfeeding Committee and also on the Advisory Board for Enjoy Birth and Parenting. She owns Mother Journey, focusing on training perinatal professionals on integrative and holistic information regarding pregnancy, childbirth, and breastfeeding. She has her degree in maternal child health, lactation consulting, and is an international board certified lactation consultant. Wilson is the co-author of two books, The Attachment Pregnancy and The Greatest Pregnancy Ever, She is also contributing author to Round the Circle, Doulas Talk About Themselves. She loves to blend today's recent scientific findings with the mind-body-spirit wisdom. Laurel has been joyfully married to her husband for more than two decades and has two wonderful grown sons whose difficult births led her on a path towards helping emerging families create positive experiences. Laurel spends her free time reading piles of research, running in the mountains with her dogs, and kayaking. She believes that the journey into motherhood is a life-changing rite of passage that should be deeply honored and celebrated. So welcome, Laura Wilson, to the show. I'm glad to have you here at All About Breastfeeding Show. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here today. 
we would love to learn a little bit of background about where you're from and what, what life was like for you and the family you grew up in. Yeah, so I actually was born to a military family, although my mother was a huge hippie, which really conflicted with <laughs> with living on a military base, and they never did. And my very early years were spent in Florida, and then we moved to Tucson, Arizona. And my parents were both very open and loving parents and always had time to focus on being parents and trying to do the best that they could. We did a lot of traveling, very low income traveling because we were not very wealthy at all. But we we did a lot of very fun things. We did crafts and we did a lot of what we called the pillow pile where we would just hang out in bed and watch movies and read together. And it was a it was a wonderful, wonderful childhood. And a lot of what I came to believe as a professional in breastfeeding and childbirth and as a doula really stemmed from my my upbringing with my family. Yeah, when you said that, I don't know if you had a station wagon, but there were five kids in my family and that was a deal. You just piled all the kids into the station wagon on Sunday and you went for a ride or the once a week vacation, again, piled us all in the station wagon. Mm-hmm, absolutely. My parents had this Mustang with the, the hatchback where the seat would roll down. And I mean, this is before we had seatbelts and they would lay blankets down and my brother and I would read for hours and pretend we were, you know, creating movies out of the back window and we would drive somewhere in the desert and go on an all day long hike. So it was, it was so much fun. <laughs> yeah. And you were actually in a great, like we had to, I'm from Long Island, so we had to probably drive over an hour to get out of the city and go upstate and do that kind of stuff. But being in mm-hmm. Tucson, you didn't have too far to go. No. Yeah. We actually lived um, at the base of the Catalina Mountains in a tiny little town called Oracle. And so we were essentially right in the middle of beauty all the time. So we didn't really have far to go at all. Yeah. Oh, I've been I've been to Oracle. That's a really nice place. Mm -hmm. Tucson is just beautiful in and of itself anyway. Yeah. So tell me, you know, with your childhood, uh, did you know at all what it is that you wanted to do when you grew up? Well, strangely, what I wound up doing was nothing that I intended to do. My father, when I was a very young child, was a primatologist and he studied chimpanzees and he really instilled a love of animals in me as well as a love of primates. And so I spent a great deal of my time as a young girl studying primates and learning about chimpanzees and all the great apes. And I just fell in love with them. And that really was my intention was to follow my father's early career after he had been military and become a primatologist myself. However, I fell in love and I fell in love very, very young. I've been with my husband since I was in high school. So we were high school sweethearts. And that took us into the military and took me on a trajectory that led me far away from doing anything close to primatology or studying animals. And through becoming a mother and the struggles that I had in the military, becoming a mother really led me to the work that I do today in advocacy and promotion of health through healthy childbirth and breastfeeding. That's so funny you say that. Do you know who Helen Ball is? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So her background is she's a primatologist. Yes, yes. It's it's funny, a lot of people who are interested in primates and, and the large, the great apes, start to develop a love of birthing and breastfeeding. And I, I don't know why that is. Maybe it's because they're such wonderful parents themselves. <laughs> I don't know. You know, just like the primates, they tend to be very good and attached parents, at least the, the mothers. With Helen, when, you know, she became a mother, she, and you know, talking about it, sleep and attachment parenting and I guess as an adult, one of her first observations of parenting and the family and Mm -hmm. sleep habits. And I, you know, I guess I'm talking a little turn for her. I I don't know that for sure, but she certainly got some of her mother stuff from watching the primates. Mm -hmm. I think we can learn a lot from animals. We really can, particularly in the mammalian world of how to care for. And I I mean, this whole new phenomenon of laid back breastfeeding. If you look at any mammal other than humans, that's how it's done. The mother just places herself in a position where her babies can access the breast and the babies feed. You know, the mother isn't necessarily positioning them or 
attaching them or latching them. She just assumes a position that's helpful. So I think we, we can learn a significant amount from our, our little animal friends. Yeah, you're exactly right. And it's, um, it just, it's just so interesting, the whole field. And it is actually quite interesting to find out what some of us IBCLCs were at our interests were before we mm -hmm. became a mother yeah. and, you know, what our dreams were before we became a mother. Absolutely. Yeah. Tell me, have you ever had the conversation with your mother? Do you know if you were breastfed? Oh, I do. I do. My mother was, as I mentioned, she was a very kind of free and open mom. She read, you know, anime Gaskin's books and she swam every single day in the ocean when she was pregnant with me, with swam with dolphins and was baking these sunbreads. And I mean, she was a very kind of attached and connected mom and she was determined to breastfeed me, even though breastfeeding was not something that was done in her family and not something she'd ever seen. I was actually born preterm. And the doctors told my mother that she would kill me if she tried to breastfeed. She happened to have a nurse who stood by her side and basically fought for her right to breastfeed. And had it not been for, for that nurse, I don't know that my mom would have had, even had access to me. Because that was, you know, back in the day where babies pretty much were in a nursery. They didn't stay in the room with the mother. So, so she did breastfeed me and she brought me home and continued to breastfeed me and um, has always been a, a real staunch advocate for, you know, really for proactive parenting, whatever meets your family's best needs. So yeah, absolutely. And when I became pregnant with my first child, the very first thing she sent to me was Ina Mae Gaskin's Spiritual Midwifery. That was my very first present. Now that is funny. Boy, I would have <laughs> loved that gift. Uh, my mother is absolutely wonderful. She came from that generation that were told you're a cow, you got to be crazy. She was given the pill to mm -hmm. dry her up. Right. But as, she, as she watched me now birth my babies and breastfeed, you know, she said, boy, if I was a mom now, I'd be having home births. I'd be breastfeeding for five years. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for her, it was, it's, it was so interesting. And the, the rates of initiation were like probably in the 20 percentile for her in the early 50s. And right. it's just so incredible in a good way how the tides have turned. Absolutely. I I love to see the progress that, that we have made as a culture with supporting breastfeeding. Of course, there's so much we can and need to do to support duration and help families to continue that long-term breastfeeding here in the United States. But our initiation rates are just, they're really I'm just so happy to see that change. Every time I get a little frustrated, I have to pull up the CDC reports. Just and even though I know what they are, I like mm -hmm. like I like looking at them. I like seeing the transition. It's this like visual picture of helping us to understand just how far we have come because we only know what we know now. And again, I think just looking back at how far we come gives me a, a lot of hope. And during times of some frustration. Mm hmm. It does. It does. Clarity, looking back, always gives us clarity for really, I, I think how, I don't want to say we have it great in the United States in terms of breastfeeding, but compared to the last couple of generations, things are definitely getting better through awareness. Oh, yeah. I mean, we, we not only have it so much better, the younger generation in interesting ways, again, going back to my mother's generation, is that the doctor was the be-all, end-all, and every sentence started with the doctor said with many mm -hmm. things related to parenting, not just breastfeeding. And as right. the generations have evolved, the last couple of generations, so the younger generation now, they are definitely partners in the healthcare. They're questioning, you know, they're looking up things, they're researching, they're taking into consideration what they're told, but they also have you know, they're able to use the, the knowledge that they have. And not that my, my mother couldn't do it, but I think there was um, a respect for the physicians to such a degree that even if intuitively they felt differently, they didn't necessarily act on it, particularly when it came to health care. And the younger generation now is like, no, nope, that doesn't sound right. I think I'm going to do this. Yeah, I I love to see the personal advocacy that's going on today and that ability to check in with how you feel about information before you move forward in, in the parenting world. I think it's 
really important because ultimately we want parents to make their own decision, what feels best to them to parent their child, but we want them to do that in consciousness. And I just love to see that that is something that is a trend that is happening with today's family. Yes, I, and I and I like the way you say trend. To me, it's a wonderful and positive trend. And I learned quite a few years ago to also not just think that, but actually when I'm working with a family or a mom to say, what do you think? How does it feel? You know, not, not mm-hmm. just the typical shrink thing and how does that make you feel, but I really just want her to be able to think about how it does feel for her and what it is that she is thinking and to know that other people you know, we may have an expertise in lactation, but there's still a lot that we don't know about her and about her baby and that her feelings and her thoughts and her thinking should all be taken into consideration to whatever care plan it is we're giving to her. I completely agree. When I teach breastfeeding classes and I have families ask me questions like, well, what did you do? Tell me about what you do when you when such and such happened or in this situation. And I always tell them, it doesn't matter what I did. What matters is what you want to do and what are the questions you have about that situation? Because my situation is only relevant to me based on the information I was given and the world at that time. What's important is how you feel about it. I really try to instill that in the new professionals that I train today, the fact that our story, of course, matters to us, and it matters in terms of support groups and and that mother-to-mother sharing and parent-to-parent sharing. But when you're in a situation of education or consulting, what is most important is the mother's story, not your story. Yeah, because what we want to do is empower her to again, take into consideration what the experts around her are telling her, but Mm -hmm. also what it is she thinks and feels and what intuitively feels right. And if she tries something, to not be afraid to say that's not working and and to try something else. And I'm always doing that with parents also. It's I, I always want them to know that this may be my story, but in the end, one of my favorite sayings is your body, your boobs, your baby. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. I'd love to hear a little bit about your breastfeeding experience, and I think it would be helpful for us to know, because you're an IBCLC now, Mm -hmm. and sometimes when we share our stories now, it gets a little colored by what we know now, Mm -hmm. and I really want you to think back to that first time baby birth breastfeeding and kind of bring us back to there and share a little bit of your story and It would be great if you could start off with, if you remember at all, what you were thinking about breastfeeding before your first baby during your pregnancy, and is there anything you did to prepare for breastfeeding? Yes. So I did read Spiritual Midwifery, and I did have a lot of conversations with my mom, and in fact, I also had a lot of conversations with Wick, because we were a military family, and of course, we were very low income as a military family, so I did tap into those Wick services. We were living in Guam at the time, and I was absolutely determined to breastfeed my child. I wound up having a forced cesarean at a naval hospital, and it led to separation of me and my baby for a couple of days because I wound up unable to stand and walk to the nursery due to my condition. And they had a policy at the time that you had to walk to the nursery in order to be able to see your baby. And I kept passing out in the hallway. And eventually my husband said, this is ridiculous. And he just carried me into the nursery and said, you can't stop her from seeing her baby. And so the first time I saw my little one, he was hooked up to all sorts of tubes and was connected to, you know, every kind of tube and wire you can imagine. He was just little, he was a giant child. He was not born early, but he was this, he just seemed so fragile to me. And I wanted to breastfeed him and to try and breastfeed this little person who I hadn't met. I hadn't even been able to see him because when I had a cesarean, I didn't have glasses and I I can't see without my glasses. So when they held him up across the room, I, I couldn't even see that there was a child there. So it had been days and I had to touch him and feel him and get to know who this little person was and then try and breastfeed him with all of these wires. So breastfeeding was was difficult. And eventually they brought him into my room. And every session from that point on for the first few weeks was was challenging and was difficult. 
and involved a lot of bodily fluids like tears and breast milk because I cried every single time I breastfed. It was just such a challenge. And there wasn't La Leche League in Guam at the time. So I didn't feel as though I had many avenues for good information. And my doctor told me just to just to bottle feed. If it was hard, just, just bottle feed. And it's funny because in my memory, I remembered exclusively breastfeeding that child. And I think it's because I have such a passion for exclusivity. And a couple of years ago, my mom shared with me some early video clips of those days. And there are a couple video clips of me bottle feeding him in the hospital that I had completely blocked out. And it just, it sent me into this spiral of kind of grief to know that I had formula fed him, knowing what I know today and knowing how I felt and how I felt about formula feeding at the time. And it was just, it was a very interesting experience, but it, it led to a very deep bond with my son and I. And I'm so grateful that I had that experience to, to breastfeed him because I, I know for sure that by, you know, his second week of life that we were, we were exclusively breastfeeding from that point on. And I really don't have a clear memory of how often I supplemented him in those first couple of weeks through my challenges. It was a good experience after the first couple of weeks. And really now after having been in the field for, you know, more than 20 years, I do see that with many of the families that I work with is that those first couple of weeks are just a challenge for everyone. We're sleep deprived. We are in a, re- a relationship with a new person and we're learning their personality and they're learning our personality. And it's not just a way about that we feed with someone, feed someone. It's how we are interacting, how we're developing that relationship. Gosh, I mean, I, I know that you've told your story many times. And so some of the extreme emotion is a little bit separated. But mm-hmm. when, when I hear stories for the first time, I'm like right there with you. And there's so many things to what you shared. And even though you don't need to go into the, the cesarean section that you had, just, you know, that knowledge base of what was not too many years ago, which was this whole insane policy of telling a mom that unless you can walk to the nursery, you can't see your baby. And Mm-hmm. And it just seems so simplistic, so common sense. Well, well, that's silly. Put her in a wheelchair, have exactly. her husband carry her, <laughs> or bring the baby to her. Like, it just makes you want to pull your hair out with the insanity of it all. You know, again, thinking about, of course, my situation, it feels horrible um, when I think back to it and I think about the, how those policies related to early challenges in, in breastfeeding, just which were unnecessary. But I, I was very recently had an opportunity to work in the Syrian refugee camps in, in Greece. And one of the mothers who happened to give birth um, while my colleague and I were there, her baby was in the NICU. And in Greece, in that particular area, the NICU is in a different building than where the mother stay postpartum. So they don't even have access. They can't, they can't go see their baby until they're discharged. <laughs> I mean, and so when we think about, yeah, in the U.S., there are things we wish would change. When we look at policies and how families are treated around the world, it's a very different situation. So I, I again, come back to that space of I'm grateful for what we do have today, still wanting to work on change, but I'm very grateful for the recognition that is cultural here of how important it is that mom and babies are together. You're, you're absolutely right. And you know, also when you talked about the bottle, it's like so interesting because we are in, I can p- probably put a lot of different adjectives to it, but those first few days, the first two weeks, mm-hmm. but particularly the first few weeks after we've had our baby, no matter what kind of birth some of us have had, there mm-hmm. is this state of Like there are some things that may be so clear as a bell to us and other things that we just don't understand how we could have forgotten. And so when you say that about the bottle, I kind of giggle to myself because I I interview probably thousands of women over the years and I facilitated hundreds of postpartum groups. And as women sometimes literally are telling their story, they're like, get this little fogginess to them also and say, and you know what? I also remember that 
you know, X, Y, Z happens. And mm -hmm. like when they're in that headspace of thinking about it and verbalizing their story, some interesting things come out and they, they will literally say, you know what? I haven't even thought about that in years or I totally, I just didn't even realize that happened until I said it out loud. The other piece I find really fascinating about our, our birth memories and our early breastfeeding and parenting memories is that emotion is so tied to our belief and our memory. In fact, our, our emotions can override what physically happened, what really happened. And I share this with families all the time about what is most important is how you feel throughout your birth experience, how you feel in early postpartum and how you feel as an early mother. So the most important thing is to set yourself up with the support people that make you feel the best and understand your needs. It's not really about specifically what happens, what procedure happened or this or that or the other. It's how we feel because that changes our perception of everything and in fact can erase the reality of memory. So one of my focuses when I when I work with professionals and I work with families is again that helping mothers to connect with their babies, to feel attached to their babies, because that emotional attachment can help override a lot of stressful events that may occur and likely will occur just in terms of being a parent because parenting is stressful. And so the more attached and bonded you feel to your baby, the better off we are forever in terms of our um, familial memories. What is something that you could share with a new mother who might even be listening now or is expecting another baby in that she is separated from her group, her, her family, her Mm -hmm. friends and you know she may be traveling around like you were in the military or just on the other side of the, the east coast west coast here in the united states and they did have a, a pretty traumatic experience or perhaps even not but they are just sleep deprived and they are really struggling mm -hmm. to do what you're suggesting you know really be with your baby and have that emotional attachment and maybe it's just their partner and them and the baby. So is there anything particular that you could tell a mom of what she should really, you know, what she should put aside and not worry or think too much about and what she should focus on? I think she should focus on what feels most important to her in that moment. One of the key challenges that every mother faces throughout pregnancy and breastfeeding and parenting long term is the interruption of, of stress and allowing stress to become chronic in our lives because it changes how we perceive our world around us. It changes our hormonal releases. It changes even um, how and who we focus on because when we are in states of chronic stress, it actually shifts the brain into a state of ego. Ego-driven behavior is not necessarily maternal-driven behavior. Maternal-driven behavior always puts your child and your family first. So Whatever is happening to her, helping her find ways to reduce stress in her body and in whatever is happening in her life. So, for example, if if it's day three and she's looking around her house and she sees clothes all over the floor and that is the thing that is bothering her the most, have a conversation with her partner about how can we how can we address this so that I can just sit here and be skin to skin with my baby and bond with my baby and have the most precious time possible. Because there's always one thing that is, you know, driving us into those, those stress states. So identifying it, not trying to fix the whole world in a day, but what is the one thing that is possible for me to work on reducing that stress so that I can just focus on bonding, breastfeeding, and, and being a new mother. I really feel that stress is, is something that contributes to so many long-term parenting challenges for families around the world. And there are some really simple strategies that parents can learn to reduce stress in their own body, but also to manage stress in their life because we cannot eliminate stress. We can't control the world, but we can control, control how we perceive it and how we react to it and also how we treat our body in response to stress. And really simple things like repetitive yawning helps to reset the precuneus in the brain, which helps our brains deal with stress better, breathing, deep breathing, simple act of um, movement. So postpartum, put your baby in a wrap and walk around your block. I mean, get your large muscles firing because that also helps the body to reduce cortisol. And 
I know that it sounds strange to shift into a conversation about stress when we're talking about what can you do when you're separated, but really it, it's one of the most important things because if we can reduce stress in the body, we can move from that ego state to the more maternal state and that connection becomes more alive and deeper between mom and baby. I am glad you brought up stress, and I I believe that there definitely is a direct correlation. What's interesting is that I had not heard it put quite that way with um, the ego versus the maternal. So that's very interesting. And the other thing that I really like that you said that I just want to remind everybody is I think we, we sometimes we don't pay enough close attention to what A, mothers are trying to tell us, or B, that mothers don't speak up. So mm-hmm. when you said that she, you know, like what's the one thing that's bothering her? Some people just don't even want to speak up and say that. Right. Because they think people will think we're silly. And mm-hmm. the people around you sometimes really cannot be in your head. And so we need for mothers to say what it is that's bothering them so we can pay attention to it, address it, and, and see what we can do to make that better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Speak their truth. And, and that's a, a, another thing that helps moms with because sometimes you're right. They, they can't be verbal. So if you can't change the situation, you certainly can remove yourself from the situation. For example, if you can't stand to see the, the dishes in the kitchen or I, I don't know, whatever it is that's causing you stress or you have visitors over, you can leave the house for a little bit. <laughs> you can walk around the block. You can just go sit in the backyard in the sunshine. You know, there are some ways that you can remove yourself for a short period of time to feel better and focus on bonding. And, you know, just like anything else in life, sometimes we're in our own head and it takes sometimes an outside observer to like make those suggestions because Mm -hmm. frequently I will walk in, you know, do a home visit and the blinds are closed and the house is kind of dark and, you know, and I'm I'm telling the moms like, it's okay. And they're like, well, I don't look good. And I don't know. I said, it doesn't matter. Just like you said, put your baby in the wrap. Because I will usually say, just take a walk from one end of the block to the other and then come home. And then that's all, that's all you do. And you'll probably feel better. And they don't even want to do that. So I'm like, well, go outside in your backyard, even if it's a little patio and just walk back and forth 20 times, get the, you know, get a little light on you and let, can we, and I don't walk around opening up blinds and making changes, but you know, I subtly will say, you know, is it okay if I open up the blinds so I can take a better look at the baby, which, which mostly is the truth actually. And so you're just kind of doing these things and we're kind of role modeling some things. But yeah, I think moms, they they come home from the hospital or even if they've had a home birth, they're just sitting in very quiet, dark homes and alone and isolated. And you just need sometimes to splash a little water on your face. Just Mm -hmm. take a walk out in the front or the backyard and because they just get so hunkered down with with the new baby and they forget that there's a world around them. And I think that can that can definitely be a mood change and can definitely affect the stress level. And we are seeing that women today are less likely to go out of the home and connect with mothers groups like La Leche League and new mom support groups. There is this tendency to stay home and isolate instead of connect. And when they do connect, they are connecting in the online groups and with Facebook and in some of those, you know, online chats. But the interesting thing is that they don't get the level of oxytocin that is supportive that you would in an eye-to-eye contact. There was this interesting article that someone wrote recently about the, the new kind of trend of mothers using their cell phone throughout labor. And they said that one of the things they think is going on here is that we have diverted our communal connection for that oxytocin (laughs) release and that connective feeling that we have that we used to get within community to our phones and our online support systems. I don't know. I've also heard a lot of uh, lactation consultants telling me today that it's very common for them to go into wherever the mom is with the child that she's doing her consulting and the mom is on the phone even when she's breastfeeding. And I'm I'm very curious about how this is this is interrupting that eye to eye connection between mom and baby in the early days and 
But I think that it's because we are no longer leaving the home to connect in community. We are staying at home, and that is a way they can reach out. So it's kind of an interesting phenomenon occurring right now. Not necessarily bad, because it's our work around with it, but I think we need to get better at encouraging them to get out and sit in a group of people <laughs> and make eye-to-eye contact. I also wouldn't say bad per se, but I think we need more of a balance because this is the trend. Mm-hmm. This is the world we live in. We can't take it away. But you're absolutely right. I work with lots of moms and they literally, when they when they go to breastfeed their baby, they're picking up their phone and they're pressing the timer. That's the first thing they're doing because they're timing the feeding. They're punching in every pee and poop and, and when they slept and when they did tummy time and all that. But the thing that really gets me is that they're pressing the timer. And so, you know, frequently I will say, I don't think we need to time it. We're going we're gonna to talk through this. We're going to have lots of questions and answers. We're going to pay attention to the baby at the breast. We're going to put the baby back on and off a few times. So mm-hmm. we don't really need to, you know, and it's like almost like this, this crutch that they now have with needing to time which side and how long their babies are on. And that's just one of the things with the cell phones. But I just interviewed Aditi Singh, who's a... Um, She's a mom and she's a writer and a blogger. And she wrote an article for, I think it was for Huffington Post. And I just recently read her article. It was about cell phones and how they are kind of getting in the way of our parenting. And I told her that this is the first time I'm going to publicly quote her. I told her that I'm going to quote her from now on. She had a list. It was like the top five things. And one of them was that our devices need to go to bed. They need a bedtime. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I I agree. <laughs> yes, like, <laughs> like we, they should. And sometimes we even have to trick ourselves. We have to take it and put it in another room because mm-hmm. the cell phones are going to bed with us. It's the last thing we're doing before we go to sleep. And it's the first thing we do. And if we wake up in the middle of the night, it's distracting us. Mm-hmm. And so I love what she said, that the devices need a bedtime. Yeah, and I think they probably need a couple naps during the day, too. Taking a little break to let you know that this episode is being brought to you by allaboutbreastfeeding.biz. If you would like to learn more about me and the work that I do and the services that I provide for moms, check out allaboutbreastfeeding.biz. You might also like to join our breastfeeding mothers group or schedule a consult or learn other ways that I can support you with breastfeeding. You will find that out at allaboutbreastfeeding.biz. You can also check out the media page and listen to other shows that I have been on as a guest. And you can learn more about what makes me tick. I always love to listen to other podcast hosts when they are on the other side of the mic. Okay, let's get back to the show where Laurel talks more about the need for mothers to take the time to take care of themselves during the postpartum period. I have seen some of your speeches and man, I just love what you talk about. So I would love if you can get into a little bit of a discussion with us about, we we touched on a little bit about, but taking care of your emotional self during pregnancy and how our thoughts and feelings, how they need to be intentional about taking the time to create a, a space for us to to spend time being relaxed within ourselves and and talking or singing to your baby exercising and that we need to take this time why we need to take this time and what the impact has on your baby in utero and I saw one of your speeches where you were literally showing pictures of the generations before you and the stress that they were under and the research that you've done. So I know we don't have a lot of time for the whole speech that you did, although I wish we did because it's incredibly interesting. But are you able to put that into uh, a, a few minutes and explain that to us, the importance? So one of the things that has been discovered recently is that, of course, our, our thoughts are simply molecules. Every time you have a thought, you release molecule, and that, they're called neuropeptides. And essentially, they're just our our limbic system's way of communicating with all of the organs in the body so that our organs are basically trying to keep us safe in every environment that we move into. And our emotions are the barometer of that safety. So if you feel happy, certain organ systems will do certain things. If you feel scared, certain organ systems will do certain things to protect you in that particular environment. Well, 
these neuropeptides, these molecules of emotion flow through our bloodstream. And one of the things we've recently discovered is that the placenta is actually listening in to everything that's going on in the mother's environment. And the placenta acts as its own brain and is taking in this information throughout pregnancy and using it as a guide and a model to help with what is now called parental programming. So it's helping to activate certain systems and genes that are going to help that baby survive best in the world that it will be born into. And so it's a, it's a process biologically that helps babies survive and thrive once they're born. So when a woman has a thought or feeling in pregnancy, the placenta sees that and magnifies those neuropeptides and sends them to the baby. So this creates the baby's emotional intelligence. Babies are feeling the mother's emotions, they're responding to the mother's emotions, and it's also helping to set the tone of development of that baby's limbic system. And a lot of moms get really worried about this when they learn about this in pregnancy. Oh, you know, I, I've been pretty stressed out or I've been pretty angry if I've had that's all fine and good because we want babies to experience a rainbow of emotions. That's healthy for them. They need to experience anger. They need to experience happiness and joy and the feeling of peacefulness and all of it. What's not healthy for them is those chronic states of stress because that literally changes their brain development and their amygdala development. And so once moms start to become aware of how important this emotional connection is between themselves and their babies, they often will, as they start to move into a state of negativity, they often will think, mm, you know what, I probably should do something about this because I don't necessarily want my baby to experience negativity. Knowledge is power. And a lot of people say, oh, well, you share this with moms and it just makes them feel guilty when they're when they're angry. And I say, no, that's not true. Because when we have more information and we have more awareness, we have the ability to make better changes. So yeah, maybe you're feeling angry and ticked off or whatever at some point in your pregnancy. You can have a moment to check in with your baby and say, hey, I'm angry. I'm not angry at you. I need to go through this emotion for the next half hour or so, but then I'm going to take some time and reconnect with you. You know, there can be this conversation that mothers have internally with their babies to help protect their babies emotionally and protect themselves emotionally. And it helps to deepen the bond and deepen the connection. And one of the things that we're finding now is that those our states of mind and our stress states and our emotional states are actually changing what's called the baby's epigenome. And these are tags on the baby's DNA that either cause activation or inactivation in certain states during development through age three. And so in a very real way, how a mother cares for herself emotionally and nutritionally and beyond is literally changing the development of that child. And there's never a more important period than during pregnancy where a woman has so much positive influence on the development uh, or negative, you know, but has so much influence in general over the long-term health of her child as during pregnancy. And then, of course, once the baby is born, that trajectory changes with the first food and connection our babies have because our nutritional states also help change our epigenome as well. Taking care of ourselves has a really broad definition in terms of health of the baby. It's how we take care of ourselves in relation to our partners, how we take care of ourselves in terms of our emotional and stress states, how we take care of ourselves nutritionally, and also how we take care of ourselves in terms of awareness and education so that we can make the best decisions possible based on the information that we have and responding by you know, making decisions with a, a full yes. We call that conscious agreement, where you take a moment to separate yourself from outside influences, to check in with yourself, to check in with your baby, and then go into that period of decision. Because then we always make the wisest decisions when we tune into our, our intuition. You answered it really well, and there's probably like 50 other thoughts that I have related to that. What I'm going to do is leave what you said just for what it is, because you said it well. Can I go deeper into all the different parts? Yes. But I'm just going to go into a couple of parts of what you mm -hmm. said. 
Sure. And one of them, which is very interesting hearing you talk about the role of the placenta mm -hmm. during pregnancy, that we are, there's a lot of information about the role of pregnancy with re relationship to nutrition for the baby. Mm -hmm. And now you put in a whole different light and added another layer to it. Interestingly enough, what you were saying, my mind started to go to, and I don't know if there's any research about this, but I think that I'm feeling like a, a very healthy placenta can really give and take of those emotions really well. And then my mind started to th think about, well, what about some of the moms that we know that there is something else going on, a health issue, or we know that people who smoke a lot during pregnancy mm -hmm. or drugs, that they're, that it changes their placenta. And then yeah. my mind started to wander to, well, what about those placentas? Are they doing that job that you just described that we're learning about? It seems to me that those, that that would happen much more inefficiently. It's very possible. The, um, the Placenta Project is a new project that the National Institute of Health is initiating now because they are realizing that, in fact, the placenta, as the brain of that it is, this neural tissue that is thinking on its own and reacting on its own, is really that a healthy placenta is probably one of the most important aspects of a health trajectory for the rest of our lives. And it's something that we know very little about. We know a ton about animal placentas, but the human placenta is unique among mammals and it's even unique among primates. Our placenta goes the deepest into our uteri than any other mammal. The way that it exchanges blood and nutrition is unique to humans. And so to answer your question, it's likely, but we don't know very much right now. And we hope that over the next decade or so, with this concentrated effort of researchers in the United States and, in fact, now around the world, that we will have a much clearer picture on how important the placenta is and what it really does. But things we do know clearly is that it is causing hormonal release and neuropeptides, and it is directing the pregnancy significantly, and it is responsible for epigenetic action throughout pregnancy. So healthy Healthy placentas are really important, and we don't know enough to say, is there something that we can actually do to initiate a healthy placenta prior to pregnancy, other than, you know, of course, healthy nutrition and, and not engaging in unhealthy drug and alcohol and, and smoking behaviors. But are there specific things that, that we can do preconception to, to help with that? It's such a new field, and it's fascinating. That's the thing I love about lactation and pregnancy is it never gets old because there's always some rabbit hole you can go down. <laughs> That's a great way, and a lovely rabbit hole it is. And it's like I always say, you know, pity the person, you know, the, who thinks that they've learned all that they need to know about lactation. I'm like, where are you living? What rock exactly. are you under? There's one thing begets another. And when I taught childbirth classes, which I did for 20 years, I used to do like a half hour on what I call the amazing placenta. And I would see the people's eyes kind of like, oh, because at this point they've gotten used to me already with going deeper into some subjects that yeah. maybe they didn't think they needed to or wanted to. But so now Lori starts on the amazing placenta. But I have to tell you that almost everybody would come up to me afterwards and say, wow, like I just, some of the words they used, well, I, I didn't give my placenta the respect it deserved. Mm -hmm. I, I just really didn't think much about it at all. And I'm telling you, I mean, this placenta project is so interesting to me. And even the little that I've learned from you today, I would definitely be incorporating that into my spiel on the amazing placenta. The other thing that you mentioned that was interesting I don't know where we have this notion of educating people about certain things, especially like about human milk and the benefits to the mother and baby. Mm -hmm. And there's this notion that some people have that to educate, we run the risk of making people feel guilty when we give them this knowledge. And it's the same thing what you were just talking about, learning about how our thoughts and feelings and actions and our stress level can affect the baby that we we don't want to tell people because we don't want to make them feel guilty you know stress is is a little out of balance even that word because we all have stress but it's depending upon you know how much we have and how long and and chronic and the like but there's just a normal daily stress and and maybe we do have times of being a little bit more stressed out than other 
and we wouldn't want to make the mother feel guilty, so we're not going to talk to her about this. But how ridiculous is that? Well, it's very paternalistic. The idea that you withhold information from somebody so that they have a better emotional experience. In fact, when I share this information with groups all around the world, really, one of the things that happens when older mothers come up to me who've already raised their children, the first thing they say is, I wish I had known. And that is across the board. Nobody says, oh, you know what? I wish I was still in the dark. And I had no, no information about how this could have changed the trajectory for my child's health. Every single person says, I wish I had known this information. Nobody's saying, you know what? I would have felt really guilty. And I hate to even use the word, the word paternalistic because it sounds very like, anti-male. And I'm certainly not anti-male at all. I love men. I think they're amazing. But it's that concept of a group of people know better than you do. It's simply not true. When we have and we uncover information, it's our duty to share that information with the people who on the receiving end, could benefit from it in some way. It's not disempowering. It's only empowering to have information. Now, the challenge is making sure that when that information is received, that we can also provide support and help and information to allow them to make the changes that are necessary. And I think when we're sharing that information, it does become our responsibility to help as well. And, and that can be challenging dependent on the community that, that you're working in. How do you plug them in to get the support and resources that they need to eat healthy and to deal with stress and to deal with certain relational challenges, you know, but it does become part of our responsibility. Yes, it definitely is our responsibility. And I'm glad that you tagged on the other piece to that is, is how we tell and the support that we give in order to help implement the information that we're giving them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know if you studied this at all, but I have so many questions from moms about, we know about the whole first year of breastfeeding our babies and the nutritional benefits. And we've come certainly a long way because even as breastfeeding became more, I hate to use the word popular, but you know, it went out of favor and then it came in favor mm-hmm. and it became more popular. And then, it, you know, we were talking about moms would hear about the colostrum. So the 25, 30 years ago, I would hear women say, well, even if I do it just for the first few days, I want my baby to get the colostrum because there was this notion at a point that the colostrum was the most important part of our milk. And then after that, there wasn't much. And then, you know, it was like the first six weeks and the first three months. And now thrilled that it's, you know, the first year that we hear the AAP and people talking about, and it's, it's filtered down to the average parents knowing that. But now we're in this state of, well, what about after the first year? Because the AAP and moms and parents are reading for the first six months exclusively, the next six months starting to add food to it. And then after that, as long as it's mutually beneficial. So again, we've almost put like a time stamp on it. And yeah. I don't know about you, but you know, more and more I hear people just saying, at least for the first year, I'm going to do whatever I can for the first year. But we all know that there's benefits for years afterwards. Is there anything in your research that you could share with us that lets us know know, like when moms go, they're in their third year of breastfeeding. Mm-hmm. And what are some of the benefits to the, the to the three-year-old at that point? Yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, is that breast milk always, it, it always contains the immune factors and it always contains the anti-inflammatory factors and it always contains amazing protein and carbohydrates. It, it's not as though it stops at one year. So every meal that a baby has, they're not only receiving amazing nutrition and immune support, but they're also continuing to receive that connection with their mom. There's no immediate stopping point where all of a sudden breast milk just turns into an inert fluid. It's always a good and healthy fluid for for the child. So the challenge, though, when you ask about research is that researchers aren't that interested in three and beyond. And so we don't see a large body of research where they are looking at long-term breastfeeding and health outcomes. The majority of research has looked at what is called the gold standard, exclusivity for six months or breastfeeding during the colostral stage. And so we have this kind of um, this desert, a research desert, really, when you look at the breastfeeding the toddler, breastfeeding the the older child, because I, I think that although as clinicians and lactation professionals, we're interested in it, 
I don't think a lot of researchers either A, have the funding for it, or B, have the interest in it. And it's a shame because, as I said, there isn't a point where breast milk turns off. It doesn't inactivate. So I can't answer your question to say, do I have any specific studies I can point to? I don't. But I think we know just from being intelligent individuals that there's a benefit to every meal and every, you know, connection that occurs between mom and baby. You said a few things that I thought was interesting. You just finished with saying there's a benefit to every meal, and I love that. <laughs> and you also said it nicer that, you know, what what's happens after a year, it goes inactive. And I, I always have a sense of humor about a lot of these things. And so when I'm talking to parents and they're trying to decide if they should go more than a year or other people are giving them flack, I will just say, you know what? Well, if you're if your physician or your husband or whoever is giving you such a hard time, like kind of take them through the motions and and say, you know, but but so you've been happy that I've been breastfeeding for six months, yeah. Well, because there's nutritional benefits and there's all the emotional benefits, and and so you're glad that I made it a year, right? Yes, I'm really glad that you made it a year. Well. On day 365, what happened on day 366 right. that all of a sudden I said, I'm like, well, what did the milk go bad? Did it turn sour? Did it get toxic? Like, like exactly. what do you think happened? And when you propose that to someone, they're kind of left with their jaw a little open. They don't know it, but we've kind of tricked them and brought them all the way to that 12 month stage where they're acknowledging, yeah, it's really good stuff. It's really good stuff. I'm mm -hmm. happy you made it that. But then what happens? Yeah. Yeah. What happens? What happens then? And I, I, I wish that we didn't put such a focus on, on timing. We, but with the baby friendly movement becoming so embraced in, in the U.S. now, we're moving away from timed feeds and we're moving away from, you know, all those things around timing. I think we need to get away from that concept of timing with with how long to breastfeed even because it is such an individual thing. And, you know, you're talking about it might be different in terms of the health outcome and health need of a child who has some specific health issues and a child who's completely, you know, who has very, very few health issues. So even to say that it's amazing to be ex exclusive for six months and then it's great to be continue breastfeeding for a year or two years and beyond, that that's so individual based on that child's emotional and physical and health needs. I dislike it. And as a professional, there's um, a little bitty part of me that keeps thinking things will change in that there's a part of me that just wants to, to think that, wow, you've, you have, you've, you've been breastfeeding a year and you see all the benefits. It's almost as if hope that at that point they would have so much of a confidence in what they were doing and feel so good at what they were doing and that it's so easy at that point. You know, kiddos who are breastfeeding at a year, it just, it's, it's a no brainer for most of us that we almost wouldn't even overthink it or even think that we have to stop because you're just enjoying it and it's working well and why, why change a good thing? Right. I would love for you to share with us, because you are so well-spoken, you have such a, an amazing amount of knowledge and such a hunger and a thirst for learning, and I know that you lecture and you do workshops, so I'd love for you to share with my audience, what are some of the things that you're currently working on, if there's any workshops or lectures that you're doing around that someone might want to attend? Yeah, I, I'm actually pretty busy <laughs> these days. I'm speaking at conferences or teaching trainings almost every week through the end of November this year. So there, you can always find out what I'm doing at my website at motherjourney.com, and I post where I'm going to be and what I'm talking about. Um, but I'm also working on a new book that is going to focus on the placenta, the epigenome, and the microbiome, how important those things are to our, to our long-term health. And I have no idea when that will be released, but that is a current, a current project. And some, some passion projects for me right now are continued research and learning about the epigenome and, and microbiome, but also I'm becoming particularly interested in marijuana and pregnancy and breastfeeding because I hail from Colorado, where we do have legal, both recreational and medicinal cannabis. There are so many questions that families have around, around this, so that is something that um, I've been lecturing on significantly. And am continuing to to learn about about myself. So I do, and I do also have a, a webinar on my my site about marijuana and breastfeeding. But those are some things that I'm 
particularly interested in now. And as I mentioned before, that's the great thing about lactation is there's always something new to get passionate and interested in. <laughs> so I love it. Yeah, I almost see you like sitting at your desk, like like rubbing your hands together. Well, thank you so much. Is there anything that I have not asked you that you felt like you have the airwaves and wanted to share? No, I don't think so. But I am completely open to connecting. If people want to connect with me, they can visit me at on my Facebook site, Mother Journey Laurel Wilson, or they can also email me at info at motherjourney.com. I, I love, and if people have research they want to share with me, I love finding new research. So I'm, I'm willing to share it and I'd love to see it. So please reach out to me. Wow, that's great. That w- it will be interesting to see what might come of that, I think, especially in, your, in the book that you're doing. And you never know what someone brings upon your desk that might stir you on another little journey. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. So much fun to chat with you today. Great. You're welcome. You take care. Thank you. Well, there you are. Another amazing interview. I want to thank Laurel for the time she took from her busy schedule to chat with me and to share her wisdom. I consider this a real treat because unless you get to one of her lectures, you just don't get to hear all this great stuff that she has to share. As a professional, I have attended some of her lectures. However, I know that for many of you, this is just not possible. This is a great way for you to have access to some of the same information that I do. I hope you enjoyed today's show, and I look forward to sharing some more information with you as I begin this season's fours FAQ shows. Until the next show, bye-bye.